Welcome to the Didi and Latel Show. Advice, thoughts, and stories from a married couple on cybersecurity, technology, and life in general. Now here are your hosts, Didi and Latel. Hello and welcome to the Didi and Latel Show. It's another week. Hi, Didi. How are you doing? Uh, not awesome. Not awesome. Not What awesome. happened? Uh, I looked at how long I'd be sitting in traffic to fetch the little asshole from the Cape. <laughs> That's the way you call your son. <laughs> yes, but you know he is. He is back from camp. He's back from camp. Uh, the only the cat is happy. The cat will be happy that he was the only one missing him. Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> well, summer is here. Traffic is here. It's crazy around Boston. Exactly. And It's great, yes. and we have a great guest. Welcome, Andy Alice. Thanks for coming to the show. Thanks for having me on the show. I just have one question: Is your son like you at all? Uh, sort of, kind of. Okay, so that oh. explains why he's the little asshole. Oh yes, because yeah. we know who the yes. big. Okay. We know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, okay. that, that, it, it, it is genetic. As uh. long as we're all on the same page, there we're good. We're on the same page. It's genetic and learned. And learned. <laughs> learned. <laughs> and learned. <laughs> I don't know. It's worse. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks, Andy, for joining. So excited that you actually made it in the in person. Um, yeah, it's been a while since we met in person. Yeah, and I have to say, Boston traffic was pretty nice this morning for me, at least. Yeah, But everybody I, is in the Cape. Yeah, everybody's already <laughs> in the Cape, and I'm just you know, taking 95 down to here, and and you don't need to go through the Sumner Tunnel. No. Oh gosh. And put the top down on the convertible. Yes. So. Yes. Uh, very yes. Nice. Same. Uh, which one do you drive? Ford Mustang. Nice. 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 2014, right before they redesigned them to look like jelly beans. Okay. So I'm very happy with. Did they have now the electric ones? Right. So th they're using the uh, the Mustang name to be a whole new line of vehicles that include a number of electric things. Okay. But it's not really what you think of. It's as not the Mustang. Mustang. It's, it's not something else. You should just think of like a Mustang as they want to take that brand and attach it to their whole new electric vehicle line. Yep. Hmm. We'll okay. see how that goes for them. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see. Branding. I ha I have an A3 convertible. Okay, that's also a very uh, very nice one. I I like smaller cars. Uh, I, I just need enough of a trunk to stick a hockey bag in in the, in the winter. Unfortunately, it's only one, so you one. cannot drive it with kids uh, when you need <laughs> yes. to. Yeah. Uh, good. Well, Andy, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience, which okay. I'm sure many of them knows you from. Your CISO series <laughs> podcast from your work with the, um, in the past as a CISO yep. and you now work with VC. So tell us all about it. Okay. So Andy Ellis, I'm, uh, let's, I guess I'll go backwards in time. My most recent accomplishment is I'm the author of 1% Leadership, which you each have a copy of there. Yes. Um, I work for YL Ventures as an operating partner. Um, so it's seed stage Israeli cybersecurity startups. And then uh, I do uh, some work with Orca, who's one of our portfolio companies, as their advisory CISO. I always love the term advisory CISO because it could mean so many different things. In many so cases, many. it really just means marketing CISO. Like your job is to produce content for other CISOs to attract them to the brand. It's a, it's a lot of fun. I, I really love doing that. Um, you know, a lot of people may remember I was the chief security officer for Akamai Technologies. I was there for 21 years. That's Impressive. a very long run. It, it really was and very, very long rare run. for a CISO. <laughs> very, very <laughs> rare. Yeah, I was the first security hire. You know, ran, built the entire security program, built the initial security products, mostly from customer demand. You know, customers would say, "Well, why don't you just do this one little thing?" And you know, at first, I would argue to engineers that they should build it, and then I would just build it sometimes myself. And then the engineers would yell at me for building bad products, but at least we had customers who were paying money for them, so we would rebuild them into good products. Uh, so I you know, learned almost every piece of the business there. I partnered with marketing, with sales, and so I got this really nice holistic view of what it takes to take a normal company and turn it into a security company. And one of the things I'm really proud of, even though I'm not there anymore, is Akamai just announced that security is now its largest revenue line. That's and amazing. Isn't uh, that? It's been growing constantly. I remember them shifting and building yeah. this. Wow. I, I wasn't aware that this is becoming the main line yeah, of business. Yeah, la last quarter they just announced that it's now their largest line of business. Like, for me, Akamai is like the web. They're right. like the infrastructure running the web. But for those of you that don't know, search it up. Uh, I mean, they're the backbone of the web. So yeah, I like to describe Akamai as like the shopping mall of the internet. Mm -hmm. What do you buy from a shopping mall? It's Anything a, you want. Nothing. Nothing. 
consumers buy from stores. Right. Stores buy from the shopping Shop. mall. Right. The ability to be closer to the users, and that's what Akamai provided, was the shopping mall infrastructure. And at some point you realize instead of providing strip malls, you should provide like this full enclosed environment. So I was the mall cop for the internet. I did security across all of those stores. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? It's amazing how the, the story is told. I, I am not half a good of a storyteller. I, 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 I am very, very impressed. I have a lot of practice on that pitch, learning that barbecue pitch. That's wonderful. Who came up with this? Is it? Oh, no, that was mine. It's yours? Yeah. That's yeah. perfect. Perfect. And tell me a little bit about the work you're doing these days with startups. Uh, other than the advisory, um, what's the yeah. angle of, uh, that you as a CISO for 20 plus years can bring yeah. to startups? And what do you find are the common issues, <laughs> challenges? Oh, there's, there's a lot of common challenges. <laughs> so the way that uh, YL Ventures works is probably to give some context is we work only with Israeli startups. We basically hunt down founders. So we have this very large network of potential founders that we're always paying attention to. And we'll look at about 500 of them a year. Now, about 400 of them, we can very quickly discard. You know, maybe they already have some money. Maybe it's very obvious that, you know, they don't even have a CEO. Um, they don't yet have an idea. So we'll just keep them in our sort of our pool but we're not going to spend a lot of energy on them. Mm -hmm. We do diligence on about 100 companies. And we'll talk to every single one of them. And it's usually you know, one of our uh, you know, investment team in Israel does that. But then as soon as we're like, oh, this is you know, potentially really interesting, what we want to do is get a buyer's perspective. So we, what we used to do before we had you know, CISOs inside the company is we relied on our venture advisor network. So someone like me, I was actually the first venture advisor, would get a text message that says, hey, can you hop on a call sometime this week with this you know, potential uh, company? Now I just get the Slack message that says, hey, can you do that? <laughs> and they give you the pitch, and this isn't a sales pitch necessarily, right? They're really trying to sell the technology and the idea and then at the end of the call, what we do, we're like, great, you've got 45 minutes to do the pitch. The CISO is going to ask you lots of questions. And then we're going to talk to the CISO. And we're going to say, like, would you buy this? Do you see a fit for this? Like, do they have an approach that is compelling? Because the challenge is that most of the people who are founding security companies have never encountered the problem that they're about to solve. Yeah, especially the Israeli side, right? They came from military. Right. They know maybe offensive, some defensive, but not from enterprise but standpoint. But not from the enterprise standpoint. Now, a lot not of them Not compliance now, standpoint, right. yeah, the governance. compliance is actually the interesting thing. Is find Because for me, I have so many ideas about how to fix the compliance world, mm -hmm. and finding the right startup who would understand and be able to solve that is very challenging. Um, yep. Probably uh, not I'm, I'm a big fan of TrustCloud. Stravish was here, yep. uh, and I'm a, I've been quoting him a lot on the that compliance right now is like, giving the auditor it's like telling your doctor about your new year's resolutions versus your blood work yes as, as, as your, the state of your health oh absolutely as a CISO what I would often say is that you engage assessors to tell you what's wrong and you engage auditors to tell everybody else that things are right <laughs> <laughs> and and like, like you cannot afford to fail an audit right and so like we have these very weird dynamics and you look like the third party risk management space is a subcomponent of it is you want to know what's going on with your third parties, but your third parties don't want to tell you what's really going on. There's like, there's no good answer here. And so we go through this and we, we have these conversations and out of those hundred, we usually will then do deep diligence on maybe 10 to 15 companies a year. And that's where they're now going to go through, you know, maybe they'll meet with up to 10 different CISOs. We're going to really help them with ideation. Um, and then we'll make investments and it will be anywhere from, you know, two to five investments a year. So full disclosure, Hunters, the company I work uh, is, at is, is one of them. One of them. Uh, yep, and we're very fortunate to have YL as one of our yeah. investors. The interesting thing is that YL is very active also right. along the way. They so help we, us a lot with positioning, messaging, getting right. to the CISO community. So yeah, so once, once we've made the investment, we're a value-add investor, and a lot of investors like to say they're value-add, but I like to joke that we're like reverse private equity. If you think about like what people complain that private equity does, which is they take over a company that is failing, they fire all of the executives, and they bring in their own team. 
we trash do innovation. They might trash innovation along the way, but often they're they're buying companies that may not be doing any innovation. So True. we'll, we'll <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> we, maybe. <laughs> but whether you like private equity or not, what we're doing is almost the exact opposite, which is we write a check to a group of founders that was going to be two to six people. They're not a company. They don't have a marketing team. They don't have a finance team. Like they don't have a customer advisory board because they have no customers. Right. So we surround them with that. We have a full service marketing team based out of Israel that's going to help with the initial marketing, help launch while they look for the right marketing hire. So instead of saying, oh, look, you have money, like let's just pressure you for returns. We're going to provide these value add services. We do it all pro bono because our attitude is that's how we make our money is we accelerate how quickly you're going to get to market. We have a playbook for the things you need to do. And why waste your money like hiring some marketing team that's just going to be ad hoc, do it for you once, and then walk away yep. when we can do that. Right. Until you actually need to have your in-house. You actually need to have in-house marketing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's switch gear a little bit. Yep. You just launched a book. Yes. Uh, super exciting. What made you write a book? So I wrote this book because I hate leadership books. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have read, I don't even know how many leadership books. Um, and I have been to more leadership training in my life than I think anybody should ever go through. Um, I was uh, worked at Disneyland. Actually, I had some very good leadership training there. I was in the United States Air Force. So I was a cadet who got leadership training and then an officer who got leadership training. Um, I always like to joke when I'm talking to Israeli or, you know, early stage founders and they're like, oh, we're in 8200. This is amazing. Tell, well, they, they're like, how cool we are. And I'm like, I was doing information warfare in the U.S. Air Force in the last millennium. Just like ends those conversations. But like I get all this leadership training and then I'm in corporate America and you get it all the time. And leadership books and training, in my opinion, suffer from two fatal flaws. And almost everything suffers from both of them, some <laughs> only from one. So one of the flaws is they treat the subject of their leadership as a saint. So it's like a hagiography. They're like, this is Jack Welch. <laughs> Jack Welch was the greatest leader of all time. And he did it all with one simple trick. It's like it's written by, by BuzzFeed or I guess Chad <laughs> yeah. GPT at this point. <laughs> yes. And like and his one secret trick was he stack ranked everybody. Now, I'll tell you a lot of things about what made Jack Welch successful, and that was not one of them. <laughs> like, that's one of the arguably worst things he ever did. You know, some of his best things were, you know, he was a white man in the 80s, like easy to run, easier to run a company at that point. Um, but he had a lot of management techniques and skills that he brought to the table. And so we pretend that if you just stack ranked everybody, you could be a great leader. You're going to fail. Yeah. The, the second thing is, if we just said stack rank everybody, you can't sell a book that just, that like the entire contents is stack rank everyone. That's like three words. Like you don't even need threads to, to share those. So people write these books and they hide their one takeaway because they only have one takeaway. So they'll keep telling you different variants of the story for you to figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like either of those. And I started to discover, you know, as a chief security officer, I'd go to a leadership training and then it would go to everybody else in my team. And so I would spend like three or four hours in this room and like I would learn something. I'd figure out what their one thing was. I would decide how I would apply it. And so before my team went to the training, I would write an essay for them. And I would say like, here is the bottom line up front. Like here is your takeaway that you should really have in your mind when you're here. Here's a short essay about why. Maybe I'll add in a story. And so as I started to collect those essays, I'm like, this is the leadership book I wish I had had. So you have a bunch of uh, bottom lines for a right. few of them. For, uh, for a few of them. So the way I wrote this book is it's a collection of essays. Okay. The title of every essay is written as a tweet summary of the entire essay. Oh, a thread summary. So a or a thread summary, said, I guess. When, now, uh, we're, now, now we're in threads. Um, and then the essays average 762 words. Can you tell I had a spreadsheet? Keep mm -hmm. track as I was doing the writing. There's 54 of them, so you can read them throughout the year. You know, if you want to just focus on one a week, if you want to read the entire book, whatever works for you. But the table of contents is your quick reference. Like if you're like, oh, there's this chapter on inclusion, you can, but I don't remember what it is. So you can go in and you're like, okay, was it chapter 20 that says, you know, inclusion is reducing the energy cost people pay just to exist in a space. Like, boom, you can walk away with that. Or chapter 21, that's inclusion is the sum of countless everyday micro inclusions. Right? I, I like the approach because leadership is not one thing. No, it's, it's not. It's a lot of traits that, you know, 
each one of us might be stronger in one and weaker in others and can yes. improve and maybe some are not applicable for right. some of us because we cannot relate to them so it's good to have a much broader variety of traits to go improve follow try to follow other than as you say one thing Uh, right. pony trick well if you if you if you're just a one trick pony the challenge is whatever you are weakest at is where you will fail your your team right because that's where you're hurting them because the reality is that most of what leaders do is hurt their organization interesting right you, because you come in and you exhaust them you make them feel excluded you make them waste their energy in so many ways and And so as a leader, just like with anything, you should look at your set of skills and whatever your weakest at is where you will get the biggest benefit by improving that a little bit. Because if it turns out that like you have amazing people who are well developed, who are well rested, you know, they show up, they're really excited to work, but not on the projects you assign them. So they're heavily demotivated to do the work in front of them. It doesn't matter if you keep investing in their skills and give them better skills. You have to figure out how to motivate them, right? How do you inspire them to align their interest in doing good work with your interest in having specific good work done? So if I hear you correctly, you need to have some good self-awareness yes. to be able to do that. And I would say I've seen a lot of uh, leaders that lack self-awareness. So how do you match that? Uh, so you have to... commit to self-awareness and then you have to figure out what are the skills for developing it yes. and so the best skill is listening to unbelievable things when someone comes and tells you something that you don't believe it's a blind spot you have they might be wrong about the conclusion they draw from what they saw but when they tell you a thing you should stop and be like what am I missing what Like, be willing to be wrong so you can learn. And I'll give a great example. You know, at one point in my tenure at Akamai, we had a, a vice president somewhere in sales who was abruptly terminated. And, you know, the rumor mill was that it was for sexual harassment, which was not actually a huge surprise given the nature of who the person was. And, you know, sort of this, it came down and I was talking with one of my female employees about it. And I'm like, well, it's really good that we have zero tolerance for this. And she just sort of stopped for a minute and gave me this look like, do I dare say what's really on my mind right <laughs> mm-hmm. now? And then she's like, oh, and I could just see it. And I waited. And I'm like, what? She said, we tolerate a lot. We can't pat ourselves on the back on this. There's just something along that. And I had to really stop and process it. That, like my experience, you know, I obviously wasn't going around sexually harassing my employees, um, was that it, it didn't happen that often. And look, this just happened. We got rid of somebody. Mm-hmm. And she's like, no, the experience is like there's mild, small things going on all the time. And it's only when it becomes big and visible and all the male executives see it that you react to it. So you don't have zero tolerance. You have this really high tolerance threshold for it because it doesn't bother you. And it took me a long time to like internalize that, but I had to hear the unbelievable thing first, that she told me I was wrong about my belief in the world. And it took me a long time to process it, because I had this blind spot. Like, I'm not noticing the sexual harassment that happens all around me, but it's once I was like, oh, now how do I make a space where that's not going to happen? Right, now I can improve because I've become aware. So as a leader, you have to commit to becoming aware And that means you have to recognize that you are wrong about a lot of the world, that you simplify what's going on around you to make it easier for you, and you have to have sensors that tell you that the world is not what you think it is. The G.D. and Latal Show will return in a moment. The G.D. and Latal Show is sponsored by ORT. In today's world, identities are the perimeter protecting the organization and are the most exploited vector by attackers. If your security teams are struggling to maintain control of identity management tools, ORT can help. ORT offers a centralized platform for discovering, monitoring, assessing, and remediating identity threats to your business. While most security platforms can take weeks or months to start identifying and remediating risks, with ORT, your security teams can get started in as little as 30 minutes and start securing the identity perimeter immediately. ORT will surface the most critical vulnerabilities and give your security teams the recommended action steps. Start your trial today at ORT.io. That's O-O-R-T dot I-O. 
The DD and Letal Show is sponsored by Hunters. Hunters is a SaaS platform purpose-built for security operation teams. Providing unlimited data ingestion and normalization at a predictable cost, Hunters helps SOC teams mitigate real threats faster and more reliably than SIM. Visit hunters.ai to learn more. Well, now you raised basically my biggest problem with engineering leadership, which is they usually promote the best engineer yes. to be a manager, to be basically an incompetent manager because the things that make you an amazing engineer, the ability to not listen to noise, <laughs> the ability to be very effective. Right. Be convinced that you're right. Be convinced that you're right, even when you're wrong, because a, a lot of times you have to swing for the bleachers yep. to succeed. So all the things that make you an excellent individual contributor engineer is all the things that make you a bad, bad manager. I, d I, w I don't want to say leader. It's because uh, everybody is, is a, a, potentially everybody's a leader. So I really exactly. actually do appreciate that. To me, a leader is anybody who interacts with someone who does work, which is converting energy to value. Mm -hmm. So if you're working in a room by yourself, you are the leader in that room yep. because you're the person doing the work and you're the person influencing them. So I appreciate that. But yes, we, we put people into management and we don't recognize that that's a completely different skill set. Absolutely. And many companies, what they do is they wait until you become a manager and then they send you to training. But yep. the training is about how to be transactional with HR. Yes. It's not about how to lead people, how to actually manage them, how to motivate them. And that's like our most valuable location in a company is that first line management level. And we just expect people to inherit and succeed rather than saying that's a completely different skill set. Yep. I like to say that there's three major skill sets and it's not hard and soft like, like a lot of people like to do. There are technical skills, which are the ways that you change the world through your own energy and through your own willpower, right? Writing code is a technical skill. Writing marketing copy is a technical skill. And the thing about technical skills is they're actually pretty easy to measure. I can see the output of a technical skill and decide if you're competent at it. Like I can compare what you write to what ChatGPT writes. If it's not better, we have a serious problem because yep. ChatGPT writes awful marketing copy. Yep. But I call it the dumber uncle. Oh, I like that. That's a great way to, I, I, may, I may have to borrow that one. I was, I would Go say for it's, it. it's that like That is the, grammatically accurate. It's, right, it's the savant ninth grader. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right? It's the ninth grade student who perfectly writes whatever the teacher asks for, but doesn't know enough for the content to be accurate, but yep. the teacher can't tell because you match the rubric. Yes. So you have technical skills and then you have people skills, which are the ways that you can affect the world by affecting another human. Right? And so that's usually where we think about management skills coming into play. And, and those are really hard. And then the last are, pro, are, are process skills. How do you affect the world by creating process that corrals humans you have never interacted with into changing the world for you? And those are almost impossible. And what happens is we take these, these competent engineers who are great at doing a technical task and we promote them up and we never get develop people skills or process skills. And when something fails in the organization, the, this manager or executive now, who's really a technician, tries to use their skills to solve the problem. But here's the yeah. reality. If it's gotten to their level, all of the people underneath them who have the same skill set they have, have already tried to solve the problem and failed. The, the solution you now need is not a technical solution that you grew up with. You're not qualified to solve the problems now. Yep. Uh, the interesting thing that, as you're mentioning, is first, very few people are aware of the fact that there is strength in the process. Yes. And it was, especially you mentioned working with Israeli companies. They love process. Nothing Israelis <laughs> love more than process, except for showing up on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the... I, 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 and you can see standing in queues. And standing in line, yes. Yep. Uh, so the... The process is even an invisible thing. Yes. And when you talk about uh, the people skills, this is a very interesting thing that people don't understand. They inherently have them. Mm -hmm. Bad, worse, they have them, but they don't understand the, the implications of what they do and how much their voices carry. Yes. I, I love the how much their voices carry, right? Is people don't realize that you walk into a room and you are leading with people's skills just by being there. Yep. 
And so if you're not paying attention to how you're affecting the room, I like that your voice carries and people are, are watching what you're doing and they're impacted by it. And that can be positive or it can be negative, right? There's some people who are just not inspiring, right? They show up and they open their mouth and like everybody's like, oh, this person again, right? Yep. And boom, that your voice carried not in a great way. Or they walked in and they're so excited and they're, they have this, this sort of joie de vivre and everybody's like, I want to work with them. They're inspired. And like this person is completely oblivious to the effect they're actually having on the world in either case. Yep. Yep. So it comes back to you know, Latal's point about you have to have awareness. You know, we talked a little bit in the past about the difference in building leadership and building the next generation in larger organizations versus startup mm -hmm. and how it's hard for a startup to invest in its kind of early management, the first line of management, as you say, because they don't have this robust programs, they don't have robust HR capabilities. As you said, maybe even large organizations fail in it, but at least they are intentional. Any things you can you have seen that work well in larger organizations that could be applied to the early stage world? Because I think it's really hard for yeah. so small startups. It's really hard for small startups, but this advice I give to every founder, um, they often forget it because they're so chaotic, which is the entire job of a founder is actually to pick up the work that they don't have anybody else to do yet. And if you look at it that way, then you know the most important skill that at any scale of an organization, which is delegation. Everybody that you hire is an opportunity to delegate more work to them. And this is how you develop people. Absolutely. Right? I, I often, I've looked at organizations that have a very deep bench and then they hire in somebody to run the organization. And I'm like, are you consciously admitting that nobody who's at the second tier of that organization is ever going to be qualified to run it? Because yeah, that means you, step up. you did something wrong. You should say, every time I hire, how can I promote someone in and take everything they were doing and give someone else and promote them? And how do I develop my people continuously by taking away from them the work that makes them irreplaceable? Right? Biggest sin in a startup is having irreplaceable people. Like obviously when you have 10 people, every single one of them is irreplaceable. But by design, when you bring in an 11th person, they should be pulling work off of those 10. And the next person is pulling work off of the 11 and you keep doing this. And what it means is you, at some point you'll realize that you should stop hiring people who have the same skill set of everybody who works for you. Like I often tell people, your first hire should be a chief of staff. Like hire somebody who can just manage the projects in your organization and keep track of things that you're forgetting. Manage your board, manage your customer advisory team, whoever it is, like hire that person because they're a skill set nobody in your organization currently has. If you have an engineering team, that has like five engineers on it. And they're like, oh, we have too much code to write. Say, so, okay, well, what else are you doing that you don't like to do? Oh, you don't like coordinating release management. There are people who love coordinating release management. Let's hire one of them. First of all, they're cheaper. Like the specialists tend to be cheaper. So hire a specialist. They do the same amount of work with less of their energy so they can get more done. So you might take you know five engineers, each one was spending a third of their time doing some you know, project management. So you look at the math, and like, well, that's five thirds of a person, but you put an actual project manager doing the work and you'll discover all of a sudden, no, no, that's only one person's worth of work. So that project manager pays for themselves basically instantly. Um, let's agree to disagree on that one. <laughs> uh, at least until the size of the organization is big enough. I'm a big, uh, big believer in what is called my Viking methodology. On a Viking ship, everybody rows. And the, there's a part in the company that you need that everybody rows. Except on a Viking ship, everybody doesn't row. So I'm going to take your analogy right there. Yeah. Somebody is steering. Uh, yes. Actually, the, this is an interesting thing that a lot of the boats that you could have had could have been steered from the rows. But, that's, but, that's, <laughs> the, but, somebody, was dictating, but somebody was dictating rhythm and somebody yeah. was steering. But that's about it. Everybody else rows. Mm -hmm. And everybody actually has very dedicated rules of engagement. Um, what I've seen a lot of times is one of the, my problem with hiring program managers 
by the way, some of my favorite people are program managers. One of my best friends here before he moved back to Israel is a program manager yep. by heart. He's, the thing that makes him an amazing manager is his ability to program manage. Uh, but a lot of times they create work for themselves if the volume of work is not there. Yes. Second is that I think there's, um, I, I like to call it the, the when do you need the specialist, mm -hmm. the Viking ship versus the village. This is what the metaphor that Dennis and I, because in the village, everybody's specialized. But in the Viking ship, not a lot of people. Are, when you need fast motion, you need a lot of generalists who are good at doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Except, and, see, but he, so I have the problem here with your Viking ship metaphor, okay. which is that's not generalists who are good at doing a lot of things. That's that everybody has one skill in common. Because once they get to their location, everybody hops off the Viking ship, and they're not rowers anymore. They're doing other things. One's an and archer, one's one, a... Right. One's a swordsman. Um, so, so I think... With any analogy, we can always strain it and, and take yeah, it a little but too I love far. That, but I love that one. I think there's, there is a point which is that, that you're on, which is, look, when you're at a certain size, you don't want to try to go in 85 different directions. Yep. Right? And so you might not say, oh, we're going to hire like the best CMO within our first 20 hires because that's not the skill you're looking for right now. And that's why, like, you know, YL provides marketing for you so you don't make a marketing hire that then you're going to regret. Yep. Somebody will supply the food to the Viking ship, right. so nobody needs to cook. S nobody needs to cook. We'll, we'll, I like that. We'll be your cooks for you. Exactly. Because you did need to have a cook on the Viking yep. ship. But right, the, the cook was also rowing. We'll just take away the need for them to do both of them. Yep. Yep. Because the reality is, if your cook is rowing, they're probably not a good oarsman, and they're probably not a good cook either. Yep. <laughs> exactly. That, that's <laughs> the, By the way, if you talk to Israeli startups... Uh, those that come from real units, not 8200 BS. <laughs> uh, I like to poke Lital because I came from other units. Are you from 81? No, 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 no. 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 Mamram. Mamram. I was, okay. I was at the, uh, uh, the calling ones Calling it real. I real. Mean, that's the... Yeah, yeah. We, we, you know, there's... Uh, Generally Everybody in the Israeli army had to go through the army at some point. Everybody. Yeah. So you need an SAP system with 6 million records. Mm -hmm. You need an SAP system with basically, unlike here that everything is distributed, all the tanks will go into one database. And oh no! Oh, wait. so when I was in the Air Force, one of the things I did actually work on was both of those systems. Was yeah. the Defense Civilian Personnel Data System that covered at least the civilian side of it, but the military the hat side as had equivalent. one. Like there's yep. a database that has everybody in of it. Course. Trust yeah. me. Yeah. And there's a database that has like every bullet and every gallon of fuel is all in the same database. Yep. Yes. So I was same. working on those very okay. very boring systems. I, Th those are interesting problems. I know. That that's why. I think that a lot of good startups come from solving the boring problems. Yes. Um, but uh, back to my uh, kind of my, my main point about the specialization. Um, it's I, I lost my point. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> I think I win if he loses his point in the you middle won. of trying to refute me. Oh, so that's, yeah, that's right. agreed. Uh, agreed. That you agree <laughs> too. <laughs> well, uh, before we go to a game, I wanted to ask: Do you have favorite leadership characteristics that you um, name in the book, or do you think they're all equally important? So I think situationally. They're, they're going to be important in different ways. Okay. Um, I think the disciplines that I think about that really matter, the first one is wellness. Like you have to take care of your own health first as a leader. That's a base. Because right? if, if you don't do it, then nobody will believe you when you tell them to take care of theirs. So you know, that's that's an important one. That's why we um, all on the Peloton app and exactly. now we follow each other. Now we all follow each other on Peloton. <laughs> I am Chief Sweat Officer, which I think is the coolest name ever. Absolutely. So, except <laughs> the problem is there's not enough letters, so officer gets abbreviated to OFCR. So when I get a shout out, sometimes they're like Chief Sweat Off Cur. I, like they can't even, they can't figure out who I am. Good so for I'm, you for so getting shout outs. Oh, I, I always I always time my milestone rides for a live ride. Okay, so I can get one. Got that's it. the that's the secret there. So wellness, um, inclusion, like you have to be invested in making sure that people are not wasting energy because they're looking around thinking they don't belong, and we send it's those so signals in the in a company all the time. If you have standing meetings that take place before ten a.m or after 3 p.m., you have told every parent that they don't belong in your organization. 
and you don't even realize that you're sending that message. But you only get standing meetings in that five hour block because, and sometimes not even 3 p.m., maybe 2 p.m., because you're either dropping kids off, you're picking them up. There's so many different things you have to do. And if you're looking at your organization and you're asking, you know, wow, why do we have a hard time retaining women over the age of 30? I was just talking to somebody today who literally asked that question. And I said, well, that tends to be the primary caregiver in a lot of families. Talk to me about your meeting structure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they've got, you know, 9 a.m. stand-up and a 4 p.m. stand-up every day because they're invested in Agile. I'm like, well, you have just told all of your mothers that they're not actually welcome to here because they, they can't show up to either of those, let alone both of them. Yeah. So inclusion. Um, third is inspiration. And inspiration doesn't need to be that you're the most, most charismatic person, but that you're connecting people with your vision of the organization and that they want to do the work. That's your third. So fourth is development, which might be the most important thing. You should be continuously developing the people who work for you. How do you give them more skills? How do you make them better than they are today? Because at the end, that's actually how you get promoted. Most leaders think they have to protect what they do so that like, they can't be replaced by people who work for them. No, the path to promotion is to replace yourself, give your work away so that you have free time to take on more work. Um, somebody, I have somebody who calls this, it's the, the angel devil model. Like you have an angel manager on one shoulder and a devil manager on the other shoulder and they should agree with you. And great leadership is when they both agree. Like you should develop people because it's good for them and you should develop people because it's good for, good you. for you. Absolutely. Um, and so those are, so those, those second tier sort of what I think of as the management tier. And then the authority tier is planning and alignment. You should know what people are working on, what opportunities are available so that you can quickly move your organization and you should keep your team aligned with the rest of the company. Because the worst thing you can do for your organization is have someone spend six to nine months working on a project and they get to the finish line and you're like, oh, sorry, we're not going to do this anymore. Because nobody cares about the project you work. Because nobody cares about it. Like, that's bad planning. How did, you, how did you let it get that far? Because why is that person going to invest their energy with you in the future? Yep. Or that's worse, it. you roll it out and then you have to roll it back because the company rejected it. Or customers rejected or customers it. customers rejected it. You didn't check with customers yeah. and they don't like the feature. Yep. So those, those are my six. I call those the six leadership disciplines that if you don't use them, you're probably destroying a lot of value. Thank That's you. That's excellent. Thank you. Well, we have a little game we're playing okay. with all our guests. So excellent. let's get to that. And now Lital and Didi present Prove You're Not a Robot. Three final authenticating questions for our guest. So, Andy, did you find what superhero you so, would be? So, so I did, and this is where there's a really good authenticating uh, question for me, because I think in the role of security, one of the biggest mistakes we make is to try to be the hero. Okay. We're the sidekicks. Mm. Mm. So I'm not a cybersecurity superhero. I have always been the sidekick. So you're Robin? My job has always been to enable... I'm more like... Um, Alfred. Okay. Like, how do I make sure that Batman gets out and is able to do Batman's job of stopping crime? Like, that's like, to me, one of the most powerful sidekicks ever. And that was my job was how did I get out of the way of my engineers so that they could do secure things quickly rather than having to decide between security and speed? Because I know who wins there. That's an excellent role. Who will play you? Nicholas Cage. Yes. You know that there's a series about Alfred. On HBO. Oh, that's right. There is. I don't think I've ever watched it, but I should. It's Pennyworth, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. So there is a show. So uh, what is your favorite hacking breach horror story? So this one was um, when I was at Akamai, we were breached by Fluffy Bunny. Mm -hmm. um, it is, if you Google that, their image is uh, not safe for work. I'll just let people know that they're like many hacking teams. They had interesting uh, imagery. Um, they breached our corporate network in 2001 or 2002. It was very, very early on. I think it was 02, but it might have been 01. No, it was definitely 02 or 01. No, it was 01. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so 2001, they, they breached our corporate network. And we had these SSH gateways that let people who were employees, you know, you could log into the gateway and then you could log into your desktop from it. So it was a sort of Easy VPN yep. via SSH. Bastion hosts. The Bastion hosts for coming in. And um, 
we found out about it because uh, and what it had, what Fluffy Bunny was doing was they would find machines like this, they would compromise them. Um, you know, they first log in using somebody's credentials that they had stolen somewhere else. They would compromise the machine and they would replace the SSH binary, so that when you SSH somewhere else, it would just write down your password, nice username, password, and target host. They would collect them and they were just building this out. And so how this found this happens? I get a, a phone call. Um, I'm actually at a massive party, one of the greatest college parties in America. Um, Steer Roast, it's made like Playboy's list of the top 10 best college parties. It's, wow. at, it's at MIT, it was the dorm that I had uh, originally been at. And my phone rings and it's a developer. And he's like, Andy, I think we have a system that's been breached. And like, I've only interacted with him once or twice. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, well, I'm in a friend's dorm room and someone just logged into my MIT account. And I'm like, so why does this mean that we have a breach? And he said, well, he says, I only ever log in remotely to, my, to an MIT system from Akamai. The only place I've ever typed my password in where it goes over the network is from Akamai. So if somebody's got my password, yeah. they had to get it from there. And I'm like, well, maybe it was an easily guessed password. And he said, mm, let me tell you what my password was since it's already been breached. And he, go, and he like rattles off this string of like 50 characters. Like, like who does this in the, in the 2000s? And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm sort of convinced here. And like he had noticed somebody had logged in because there's a login notice that goes out at MIT. Oh yeah, in fact, there's the, the image that we have over here. I don't yeah. know if you want to actually put that up on your show. Uh, we don't mind, uh. we, we're, we're not. Uh, we will put it. Right? We are already. So we now had to go figure out like what was going on, find all the machines that had been compromised and all the passwords, force people to rotate. Um, it, was, it was pretty awful. Um, we actually reacted very quickly. Fluffy Bunny actually put out a press release that we were so awful for not giving them credit for finding, you know, we, we found them and kicked them out faster than anybody else, as near as I can tell. Um, on the bright side, you know, awful thing to get, you know, very early on, I'm just a security engineer and like, boom, everybody's dumping this on me, um, was we actually took that to get rid of password-based login, went to everything with SSH keys. We were fortunate that while they were dumping the passphrases to SSH keys, um, they did not actually copy the the files, so we had this limited window. We still rotated everybody's you know, yep. you know files, but that was a pretty awful event to go through. Very early on, it was like, what do you do? How do you? Because people then said, like, what could these people have accessed? And the answer was everything. Like they they stole source code that later got disclosed. Um, you know, it's not the end of the world, but this uncertainty about how much harm could have been done was was like sort of carried over for a couple of years. Like you're always sort of turning around and going, is this fallout from that event? Interesting. Very, Very interesting. interesting. Do you know if um, other organizations were impacted with similar, because I would assume other oh, yeah. organizations had the similar yeah, there authentication were a number, methodology. Yeah, a lot of companies at the time were breached you know, very similarly. Um, I think they even you know, published, uh, published, like here's all of the companies that we breached uh, at one point. Yeah. Very interesting. Very That's interesting. Also, it kind of uh, identifies all the gaps in the two early 2000s of all the systems that we now have in place to make sure that now you assume that you're going to get breached right. and you assume that the first thing is time to remediate versus other aspects, yep. yeah. which yeah. has changed a lot in the last yeah. few years. Yeah, I think Definitely. that those are the early breaches that kind of taught all of us that breaches inevitable. Um, yeah, and, and it's and like, and now what do you do? And you know, at the same time, how do you seize that momentary opportunity? Yep. Yeah. Like it wasn't like we designed this whole idea about changing how we did login. Like we had already been noodling it. It was like, oh, this will fit, solve the problem. We already have to make everybody in the company rotate every password, every key. Let's institute better systems for yep. this. Yeah. Great. And last but not least, what's your favorite waste of time on the internet? Well, it used to be Twitter. <laughs> but that was a long time ago. Um, most recently, so I've been playing with this thing, this thing called the NAND game. What is that? It lets you build a computer component by component from switches up to NAND gates. And you basically have to build like an arithmetic logic unit out of components you've already built. So it's cool. really nicely done because once you build a component, now that's just available to so you. You don't have to rebuild it in subsequent levels. And it's very much reminding me of some of my undergraduate classes, but in like this very nice, easy way. I'm not actually trying to like wire things together. I can just do, the, do it on the web. That's awesome. Super cool. Great. I, th I think uh, 
I, th- I think there's two offsprings that might like it. Yeah, yeah I will, I will tell you that the first level is very confusing. You're trying to figure out like how this interface works, what these things do. But once you build your first NAND gate, everything's fun from that point on. Awesome. Excellent. Well, we highly recommend for everyone to get Andy's book. Is it going to be available on Audible as well? Yes, it is available on Audible or wherever you get your audio books. And I'm the one who read it. So oh, awesome. This lovely voice. Wonderful. We'll hold up the book so people can see it. Yes, uh, you and can, we'll put a link to can, it. Yeah, you can find notes. it on basically any bookstore. So it's on all the online bookstores and in many you know physical bookstores. So if you have a favorite indie bookstore, um, go there. If you want one signed, you go to my website, go to csoandy.com slash book. And there's this big banner at the top of that page that says, if you want a signed copy, click here. Excellent. You go to my local bookstore and they have signed copies on stock. And I'm sure people can ask you questions and comment and give you other ideas for Abs- the follow-up book. Absolutely. Feel free to find me pretty much anywhere. I am CSO Andy or some variant of that on just about every social network. Well, Andy, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Everyone, thanks for listening and joining for another uh, Didi and Vital show. If you like the, this show, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcast. We're here weekly. Thank you and see you next time. Thanks, everyone.